Thanks very much, Trevor. Can, can you hear me? I need to leave the I'm slightly sorry, I was expecting that to be a different slide, but I will start there. So, ah, oh, here we go. So, some, I mean, firstly, some, some antecedents to the standard proper, if you like. Um, where does it come from to plug this into um, the IUCN structure um, and the IUCN's higher level objectives? So, it very much builds on, comes out of um, the CBD, Aichi Target 11, and in particular, um, developing um, protected areas that are conserved through effectively and equitably managed ecolog ecologically representative protected areas. So effectively and equitably managed is the piece I want to pull out of, of the CBD Target 11. Um, then going into the, and I don't know how to pronounce this, apologies to any South Koreans here, Jeju Resolution. Again, that's if you like the marching orders for the GLPA, for protected area, the, the Green List for Protected Areas. Then a business plan. So these are objectives from the business plan. And I'm going to jump through that straight to the standard, which is where I was brought in to help IUCN turn some of these antecedents into a formal standard. Um, that's, in one level, a beautifully circular statement. Um, if you take out the circularity, what it says is that the standard is what you have to meet. If you meet the standard, then you can be greenlisted. It's as simple as that, okay? So in a way, it just says what a standard is, and it's going to be the greenlist standard for protected areas. Um, I'll come back to the, the first bullet point there, which is extremely important, the IUCN mission statement. Um, a just world that values and conserves nature and just pull out that there's a social component to that and a natural values component to that. And those two values, the social and the natural, are in the DNA of the Green List of Protected Areas. They're in the DNA of the standard. They're all the way through it. Okay, and I think that will come up um, several times in the presentations um, this afternoon. Um, the standard itself builds very heavily on a lot of work um, done on management effectiveness. So the work in the, the content of the standard builds on that and then tries to add to it um, some measure of success. So how do we know if we've achieved success um, in relation to protected areas? There's a process for the development of the standard. There's a, a GLPA um, steering committee providing the, the governance from IUCN. Um, they established an international standards group that was responsible for drafting the, the standard and my work as a consultant was to contribute and facilitate their work. And then there have been, um, it's eight countries it covers, it's slightly less than eight reference groups because one of those reference groups is regional, covering several Mediterranean countries. But there's a, a geographical and in some cases a technical level of um, expertise to take the international standard and make sure that can be modified, adapted, applicable um, at the a more local level. The content and structure of the standard, these are, it's divided into four pillars. Um, some other standards would call those principles. The four pillars of the GLPA standard are sound planning, equitable governance, and effective management of the three, I suppose, base pillars. And in each of those three base pillars, there's a strong social component and there's a strong natural values component. It's in the DNA, it's in, both of, in all three of those pillars. Getting those right, building on the, the management effectiveness, leads to successful outcomes. So the fourth pillar, or sometimes we refer to it as the capstone, is are the outcomes successful? And that means, is there social equity being achieved in the protected area? And is it succeeding in the conservation of the natural values that it is intended to protect? That's the high level structure um, and content of the standard. Those four pillars are then divided into 20 criteria. And each criterion is divided into two, three, or four indicators. And it's a hier hierarchical structure. So it's designed so that what you actually measure are the indicators. If the indicators are met for a particular criterion, then the criterion is met. 
And if the criteria are met, then the pillars are deemed to be met. It has that hierarchical structure. I mentioned the reference groups. The pillars and the criteria are set at the global level. So the intent is that they provide a consistent framework that would be applicable everywhere in the world. It provides a level standard so that one green list of protected area in one place in the world um, can be deemed to be equivalent to another green listed protected area in another part of the world. There's also a generic set of indicators. So it starts off with a set of, and there are in fact 64 in the generic set at the moment, um, that you actually evaluate in the field, but the reference group process allows those generic indicators to be debated um, at a more geographically or technically specific level, and if necessary, adapted to make sure they are applicable um, in the protected areas under the jurisdiction of that reference group. Finally, we've just finished, um, I came in halfway through, but in fact a two-year pilot process. So we've finished that, it's been launched, there's a lot of energy. But I should emphasize that that was the end of the pilot process, and we're just entering into um, a development phase, which is expected also to be two years long. Um, there'll be a, more, a, more, a broader and more formal international standards development process, um, compliant with the ICL Code of Good Practice. And many of you will be familiar with ICL, and IUCN is a strong supporter of ICL. It provides um, an increasingly broadly recognized, as it says, code of good practice, what you, how you should be going about setting social and environmental standards in an inclusive, participatory, and fair way. And my colleague Sonka will talk a little bit about ICL as it applies to other parts of the system. So that process will include a formal stakeholder analysis, it will include stakeholder consultation internationally, a lot of transparency, I hope you will all be involved, will participate, will contribute to that, um, and further field testing. We expect not only by the current reference groups, but by additional reference groups. And for those of you who are at the launch on, on Friday evening, um, there are, I think, six or seven countries that have stepped up to the plate and said they would like to be involved during this development phase, which is incredibly positive. Um, and also, I've mentioned geographical reference groups. There's the Conservation Assured Tiger Standard, and um, Khalid will be talking about that later on. And there's a whole program of um, technically rather than geographically um, specific um, areas that we hope will be involved in the pilot testing. That's a very brief introduction to the standard. Um, I will hand over now to, to James, who will talk a bit about uh, the governance and the process that we've gone through. Thank you very much.